words with messages or symbolic language. Those kind of things have been around for a long time. But back in the 1990s, there was this movement among Christians uh, where a lot of Christians were buying bracelets or T-shirts that had the letters WWJD. A lot of you probably remember that. And those letters stood for the question, what would Jesus do? And the intention behind that reminder was to filter our daily decisions through that question, to think about how would Jesus handle this situation, how would Jesus uh, deal with uh, these people in my life, what would He want me to do, what would He want me to say, how would He want me to process uh, this situation, what would Jesus do. And you can still get those wristbands, those t-shirts still exist. They're pretty cheap on Amazon, actually, if you're interested in buying those kind of things. Uh, but it, it's, it's still a really good question to ask uh, in our daily lives, but I want to ask a slightly different question in this series. It parallels in some ways, but uh, the question is this, what would Jesus undo? If Jesus was editing your life, if Jesus was editing my life, are there things that he would want to change? What would Jesus want to undo in my heart? What would Jesus want to undo in your uh, way of thinking or in your pattern of behavior? What would Jesus undo? And you look back into uh, the, the Gospels and you see the life of Jesus and you read very, very carefully what you'll see is that when Jesus was here on earth, he really wasn't interested in token gestures or things like bracelets and t-shirts and those types of slogans. Uh, Jesus was more interested in what was going on in a person's heart than he was in outward appearance. Jesus had a tendency to smash the status quo of religious activity. He, he liked to shake things up when it came to spiritual apathy. Oftentimes in the Gospels, we would see that uh, Jesus would go up against those who were critics uh, or those who were, who were uh, dishing out hate towards other people. He would oftentimes go toe-to-toe with those people and, and, uh, and, and demonstrate love and call people towards forgiveness, you know, even when people didn't want to hear it. Jesus was someone who brought hope uh, to those who were hurting. He brought life to those who were lost. He brought freedom to people who were tangled up in sin and needed grace, who needed forgiveness. And and really, that's what I'm hoping this series will be about for us, that we're going to move beyond slogans, that we're going to move beyond some of the Christian jargon that we sometimes use and throw around and move beyond all of those kind of surface level things and let Jesus take a look at our hearts as they truly are, look at the knots and uh, have him reveal to us some of the things that he would undo. What are some of the things that Jesus would change? What would Jesus undo in my heart and in your heart? And we're going to kick off this series with one of the things I'm very confident that Jesus would want to undo in my life, he would want to undo in yours, and it's this, spiritual indifference. Spiritual indifference. So if you're going to take some notes this morning, you can get on the digital notes online. Hopefully there'll be some things there that you can write down just as some reminders on your phone, on your tablet. I told my family that I was doing a sermon on indifference, and they said, eh, we don't care. Let it sink in. You'll like hit that at lunch. Like, that was really funny. That was, that was actually my wife's joke. I'll give her the credit for that. You know, last, last summer we had the opportunity to go out west and see the Grand Canyon was one of the things that we got to see. And uh, I had seen the Grand Canyon a couple times when I was younger. And I can remember the very first time seeing the Grand Canyon, stepping out uh, onto the rim and just looking at how vast it is and how uh, just incredibly beautiful. And it really is, the very first time you see it, it's breathtaking. Uh, It's overwhelming of just how vast and beautiful it really is. And uh, then a couple years later, I saw it again, saw it for the second time. And I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, but... When I stepped out that second time, it's still pretty, right? It's still the Grand Canyon, uh, but it, it, it didn't have that same wow factor for me. And I was like, wow, this is still pretty, but I'm hot. Let's go get some ice cream, right? It was only like a 10 minutes. I'm done. Let's move on. And I felt bad about that. And I still kind of look back on that experience and think, man, why, 
What's wrong with you? Why would you ever be indifferent towards something as beautiful, as amazing as the Grand Canyon? There's something broken inside of me uh, that, would, uh, that would cause me to kind of think that way. And I tell you that to ask you this question. Have you ever felt that way about your faith? Have you ever felt that way about your relationship with God? Like, you know better. You know that you should be in absolute awe of who God is. You know that you should be overwhelmed at the, at the thought of everything that Jesus has done for you on the cross. You should be overwhelmed at the thought of the power of the resurrection. And yet, there are times when Christians get into this place where they're just kind of like, meh. And they go through the motions of spiritual activity, but they're not overwhelmed. They're not in awe of who God is and everything that Jesus has done. Like you sing a song. We sang some really great songs this morning. And there's people, you know, they'll sit in a church service and they'll sing a song or maybe not sing. And they're just like, meh, not really my thing. Maybe they'll read the Bible once in a while and, and they'll read some verses. And they're like, eh, didn't really get much out of that. Not too exciting or get invited to a grace group, right? We talked about some grace group opportunities throughout the summer. Someone invites you, eh, I don't know. It's not really my thing. They, there's service projects that are happening, different ministries that you could jump in and be involved in. Eh, I don't know. I'm busy. I got a lot going on. The ironic thing about this conversation this morning is, you know, we're talking about spiritual indifference. And if that's kind of where your heart's at this morning it's going to be really easy for you to take everything that we're going to talk about today and be like, eh, I don't care, because that's just where your heart's at. And I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to at least open up the possibility that if that's where your heart is, it's not okay. Maybe you've been in a place of spiritual indifference for a long time. It can change, and it needs to. I want you to think about how Jesus must feel when he... When he looks at our lives, when he looks at our hearts, and he sees spiritual indifference, after everything he's done for us, after all the agony and the torture that he endured on the cross, we actually don't have to wonder how that makes Jesus feel because Jesus actually told a church in the first century exactly how spiritual indifference makes him feel. So I'm going to invite you into uh, those comments that Jesus made in Revelation chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, you can join me in Revelation chapter 3. You can grab the one there in your pew, jump on your tablet. But join me in Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 15. And what we're about to read is a letter that Jesus told John. John is the writer of the book of Revelation. And Jesus told John to write this particular section of the letter to a church, to a group of believers in the city of Laodicea. And what's really interesting about the city of Laodicea is that it was destroyed, completely leveled by an earthquake about 35 years before this letter was written. But even among that devastation, those people were tough, they were strong, and they rebuilt the city. In fact, they rebuilt it better, stronger than it ever was before. They they built these Amazing stadiums and theaters and public baths and shopping centers. You know, they're all running around with t-shirts that say, they ought to see you strong. Not really, they didn't have those. But there was the kind of thing where they were really proud of themselves because they had come from this absolute devastation. Now look where we've come 35 years later. This city is amazing. They did have one issue in the city that was a perpetual problem before and after the earthquake, and it was their water source. They had no good water source in the Odyssey. And so, you know, in, take Las Vegas, for example, an amazing, incredible, bright city, uh, but they don't have their own water source. And so that was, uh, that was fixed uh, by Hoover Dam, right? The, this incredible engineer, engineering marvel of Hoover Dam makes that city possible. Well, Laodicea had water source uh, issues, and so they built these aqueducts that came from two other cities. Uh, Colossae was a city that had uh, this amazing fresh mountain water from these springs, and it was, it was incredible and very cold. 
and they would pipe that water down through these aqueducts to the city. And there was another city, Heropolis, which was famous for these hot springs. People would go there from all over the place for medicinal reasons and for healing purposes to be in these hot springs. And, and so they piped water down from Heropolis through these aqueducts. So they had this really cold, refreshing water, this amazing uh, hot spring water, and it's coming down by the time it gets to Laodicea. It's lukewarm, and it's disgusting. And, and people who would travel, and they would come to that city, and there's all kinds of documentation throughout the ancient world of just how gross it was, and people hated it when they would visit Laodicea. Now, what's interesting about all of that is when Jesus addresses their spiritual indifference, he takes that physical reality that they dealt with every single day, and he uses it to point out just how disgusting their spiritual indifference made him feel. Verse 15, Jesus says, I know all the things you do, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I know your deeds, Jesus says. I know how you're living your lives. You're like this lukewarm water in your city. Your spiritual life is just meh. We don't really care that much. And Jesus says, that's a problem. It makes me want to spit you out. Literally, the word there should be translated vomit. Their spiritual indifference turned his stomach. It made him sick. I was thinking about that image. That's a pretty strong way to describe how Jesus reacts to their spiritual indifference. And I was thinking about what are some of the things that I would see in behaviors or actions in other people or attitudes that would make me physically sick? Uh, there's things that I'm sure we've seen on the news and uh, that have disgusted us. There's things that people have done. They're pretty bad, right? If it gets to the point where it's making you physically sick and it kind of turns your stomach, I can't believe that someone would be able to do that. And yet this is how Jesus describes spiritual indifference. And I tell you that so that you understand that you shouldn't have a met attitude towards spiritual indifference because Jesus takes it very seriously. I don't want Jesus to look at my life and, and have his stomach turn. That's not what I want. And I would hope that you wouldn't want that either. So we need to take this very seriously. I know your deeds. I know how you're living your life. You're living this lukewarm Christian life of spiritual indifference. Pastor Craig Grishel has written a description of the lukewarm Christian. That I think it's pretty good. I want to walk uh, you through it. Um, but I'm going to ask this of you because I think we all have a tendency. I'm not saying you would do this. I'm just saying we have a tendency when we do things like this, we have conversations like this, that uh, we go through a description of the lukewarm Christian. I'm going to ask of you, please don't think, yeah, I know who he's talking about. About three rows up, that's exactly who that is. That description you just gave is her, it's him. I'm going to ask of you to please just be open and honest with your own heart. Be open to the possibility that maybe some of the things that we're about to describe when it comes to lukewarm Christianity, when it comes to spiritual indifference, maybe it's you. Here's the first one. The first one would be, are you more concerned with impressing other people than you are with God's calling in your life? Now, I would say that I think the older that we get, uh, the less we tend to care about the opinion of other people. I think that does seem to happen as we get a little bit older. I think that uh, when we're younger, you know, our students in the room, this is something that uh, you probably struggle with uh, on a daily basis, you know, social media and, and these questions. Do you like me? Do you think I'm cool? Do you, do you, uh, do, am I listening to the right music? Do I have the right clothes? Is my water bottle the right water bottle? You know, there's these kind of questions. Did you see my selfie? I didn't get a lot of likes on my selfie. And why don't people like my selfie? And so I think when we're younger, there's this pressure on us to want to be accepted, to want to be liked by others, and sometimes we are willing to sacrifice our concern for God's calling in our lives because we want to be uh, accepted by other people. I do think, though, that as we get older, it doesn't go away. I think maybe it changes 
Maybe we don't care necessarily about what people think about what we have on our clothes, but sometimes we worry about, you know, do people like the car that I drive? Are you impressed with my house? Are you impressed with the vacation that I went on? the stuff that I own. Sometimes uh, we uh, are consumed with trying to impress other people and less concerned about God's calling in our lives. And when that happens, there is a spiritual indifference that settles in on our hearts. Here's another possible description of spiritual indifference. Are you obsessed with life here on this earth more than you are focused on eternity? Does it matter more to you to chase after the things that the world has to offer? I've got to have the newest thing and uh, whatever is best, whatever's shinier, whatever's faster. I I want more stuff. I want better stuff. When we tend to focus on the things the world has to offer in the the immediate and and all these uh, shiny things the world says that we have to have, when we do that, we have a tendency to to invest less energy, invest less uh, of our resources into the things that actually matter in people's lives and throughout eternity. If we're not pursuing a life of greater generosity because we're always consuming more and more for ourselves, there's a spiritual indifference that has settled on our hearts. How about this one? Do you minimize or rationalize sin instead of truly fearing God? Do you say things like, you know what, my sin's not as bad as you know, his sin. What I did's not nearly as bad as what she did. I want you to just think about that statement because uh, what someone else did is irrelevant to whether or not what you did or what you said is right or wrong. You, you get that, right? Yeah, maybe what they said, what they did was terrible, It doesn't excuse or wipe away our own uh, wrong thoughts, wrong behaviors, wrong words. That's not how it works. If we said something, if we did something, if we thought something that's wrong, it's still wrong. Do we sometimes try to rationalize our sin? You know, it's not that big a deal. Everyone does it. Don't you judge me. Who are you to judge me? It's my life. I'll do what I want. I'll set my own rules. I'll set my own standards. And if that's how we're approaching life, if we're not concerned about God's standards, God's boundary lines, those types of things, then there's a spiritual indifference that has settled on our hearts. How about this? Do you believe in Jesus, but you don't share your faith? You believe in Jesus. You're glad that you're saved. You're glad that you're not going to hell, but you have no desire to share your faith with others. I think sometimes as Christians, uh, we could get somewhat focused on the first part of John 3.16 in the gospel. God so loved the world. He sent His one only Son to die for us. And we like that. That's good. And then we, we maybe look at the second part of that, which talks about you know, when we believe in Jesus, that we don't perish, that we don't go to hell. Well, that's good. And we approach it as if it's a mirror like we're looking at the verse in, in, in a mirror. Well, I'm glad, whoo, glad I'm not going to hell. That's good news. Instead of approaching the verse like it's through a window, understanding that there's people around us, our friends, there's family members, people that we work with, people on our sports teams, there are people that are perishing. They are headed to hell because they don't know Jesus. And that doesn't bother us if we're just satisfied. Well, I'm not going to hell John 3.16 is really great. And we don't approach it to, with, a, with a concern for the, the eternal soul of someone else. There's a spiritual indifference that has settled in our hearts. How about two more here? Do you, do you only turn to God when you need something? Do you only turn to God and pursue Him when you're in trouble? You know, you keep Him on a shelf until you need something, until it benefits you, and you're having a bad day. I'm having a bad day, God, let's get you off the shelf. I need you to to do something in my life. Be at work in my life here. Then we have a good day. You You better stay on the shelf. I don't want you messing in my life today, Lord. You just stay there. I'll let you know when I need you. If we are only thinking about God, if we're only talking to God, if we're only pursuing a relationship with God when we're in trouble, when we are in need of something, there's a spiritual indifference that has settled in our hearts. 
One more. Is your life not much different than the, the people around us that are far from God that do not know Jesus? There's not much difference between your, what your life looks like and someone who, who is far from God. Same entertainment choices, same life standards, same priorities. You treat marriage the same way. You treat parenting the same way. You treat money the same way. Just not a lot of difference between you, your life, your decisions, your priorities, and those who are far from God. When that happens, it's an indicator that there's a spiritual indifference that's settled in our hearts. I was reading through that description. I think he did a really good job with it. And I'm wondering, okay, how does that happen? I, I, don't, I don't want that to be true of me. I don't want Jesus to look at my life and be disgusted. So if, if some of these things are true in my life, how did that happen? How did I get to that place? What about you? You, you heard those. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you identify with one or two. How did it happen? How did you get to that place? Right? When you first trusted Christ... It was like you were overwhelmed at the thought of what Jesus did for you on the cross. And now, eh, how did that happen? Before we look at how Jesus tells us we should fix the problem, let's get to the root of it. Look at verse 17. He gives us an indication. He gives us a window into how this can happen in a person's life. He says in verse 17, You say I'm rich because I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. You don't realize you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Jesus points out that we, the spiritual indifference can happen because of self-sufficiency. I don't need anything. I have everything I need. I got my phone. I got my Netflix account. I got money in the bank. I'm good. I don't really need much else than that. I don't, I don't, I don't need you know, these songs. I don't, need, I don't need the believer's encouragement. I don't need that. And we have these conversations about spiritual health, and it's like, eh, you could take it or leave it. Sometimes I think Christians get to this place where they have just enough Jesus to feel good about themselves. You know what I mean by that? I got enough Jesus to know that I'm not going to hell. I have enough Jesus in my life to, to know that if I need him, he's there. I know where to find him. The problem with that spiritual indifference is that it turns the stomach of Jesus. It makes him want to vomit, and he uses words here like wretched. He he uses words like disgusting, right? You don't realize how miserable and poor and spiritually blind and naked. Those are problems. How do we fix it? Sometimes, you know, this, this self-sufficiency, this, uh, this worldly satisfaction, I have everything that I need from this world. I don't really need uh, this, this spiritual stuff in my life. Uh, if, that's, if that's how we get to that place, self-sufficiency and worldly satisfaction, how do we fix it? What's the solution to that spiritual indifference? Well, Jesus gives a solution here starting in verse 18. He says, so I'm advising you. I'm counseling you to buy gold from me. Just so you understand, we're about to read some, uh, some spiritual uh, word pictures. Right? We're not physically buying physical gold from Jesus, right? These are, these are images that he wants us to think about. So I advise you, buy gold from me, gold that's been purified by fire, and then you'll be rich. Buy white garments from me so that you'll not be shamed by your nakedness. Buy ointment for your eyes from me so that you will be able to see. One of the things that we pull out of that, those, uh, those verses is the, the beginning solution, the beginning part of uh, being able to break the spiritual indifference is actively pursuing the things that matter to Jesus. Actively pursuing the things that matter to God. I am not what you would call a concert person. Some of you are. My wife is. My wife loves concerts. Uh, When we go to a concert, she's super into it, and she gets lots of blessings from that. And uh, oftentimes, there's me like this. Yeah, I could take it or leave it. Just not my thing. Um, 
my wife is really into dogs and puppies. Now listen, I don't want beat up or anything like that. I'm just saying uh, I, I'm not anti-dog. I'm not anti-puppy. Uh, we have a very nice dog, and she's a sweetheart. But if, uh, if you were to say, hey, you want a puppy? Yeah. Not really, you know. I, I'm just not that kind of person that feels the need to have a pet. I know you're going to be like an organized prayer meeting in the parking lot after. We, let's hold hands, pray for Pastor Mark. There's something broken in his soul. My, my, uh, my wife and I were dri- driving out into the country recently uh, to a family function, and uh, there's woods on one side and there's field on the other side, and there was a bald eagle that uh, flew in the same direction of us and, you know, kind of patterned with our vehicle for a little while. And she was amazed. She was super excited. I thought she was going to jump out of the truck and fly the thing. I really thought that's what was going to happen. She was so excited about it. And I'm like, eh, it's nice. I look at that in my own life and I'm thinking, okay, I'm not really into concerts. Puppies are okay, you know. Golden Eagles are nice. Grand Canyon was nice the first time, right? I know there's probably some lots of things wrong with me. I get that. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking at my life and maybe why I am that way. And here's one possible reason. I'm pretty sure this has something to do with it. I have a really hard time uh, just slowing down long enough to be in the moment. That's just something I've always struggled with. It's something I know about my personality. It's something I try to work on. You know, we're going to be going on vacation soon, and usually when we go on vacation, it's like day three till I've un, like I'm actually unwinding enough to enjoy the moment of, uh, of being able to rest. And it's just kind of how I'm wired, and I know that about myself. But here's the deal. Even though that may be true of me and how my brain is wired or whatever, there's things that are important to my wife. There's things that she values and because I love my wife because she matters to me then the things that matter to her should matter more to me than just to go and blow them off like they don't matter at all so it's not acceptable as a husband to just walk through life and then when she gets excited about something uh, when she's really into something that matters to her to just blow that off like what's wrong with you it's not okay And when Jesus says here in these verses, I'm telling you, I'm advising you to buy, you know, the the goal. Let's talk about the spiritual images of what he's talking about. Gold's a picture of spending your energy, your resources on things that have lasting value and not just not just on the stuff that won't that won't last in eternity. Nothing wrong with having some nice things. But are you spending all of your resources, all of your energy on yourself? Are you investing in things that really matter? Jesus talks about white clothes. It's a picture of righteousness. It's a, it's a picture of, of pursuing a life that pleases God. Are you, are you just satisfied to set your own standards for life? This is what I think is right. This is what I think is wrong. Or are you pursuing the things that God says is right? The things and, and, and running away from the things that God says is wrong. The eye salve is a picture of being able to see things the way Jesus sees them. And seeing value in the things that Jesus sees value in. Seeing value in the people that that Jesus sees value in. And when you see a need, when you see a a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker that has a need in their life, you have an opportunity perhaps to meet that need. To ask yourself, what could I do to meet that need in this person's life? Is there some way for me to do that? Rather than just feeling bad, oh, that's terrible, I'm so sorry you have... Uh, this need in your life, do something about it. It's seeing value in the things that Jesus values, which, uh, which oftentimes is demonstrating love in people's lives and, and, and doing the right thing. These are things that matter to God, and they should matter to us. So actively pursue the things that matter to Jesus because we love Him. Here's the next one. The next part of this Uh, He says in verse 19, I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent, take this seriously, and turn from your indifference. Turn from your indifference is a way of saying repent. Turn away from the spiritual indifference and turn back to God. Turn back to valuing the things that God values. And, And 
investing in the people that God wants you to invest in. Instead of just being meh as you walk through life. And when we do that, when we repent, we looked at this last week, when we repent of the things that aren't right in our lives, God is faithful and just and He offers us forgiveness and that's where change comes from. So we actively pursue the things that matter to God, the people that matter to God. We repent when that's not happening in our hearts, when that's not happening in our lives. And then this last thing is this. He says in verse 20, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, if you open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. Here's the third part. Invite Jesus into the center of your life. Jesus is not supposed to be a hobby when you're bored. Jesus is not supposed to be a weekend activity that we fit in if we've got nothing better to do. Jesus is, is not supposed to be a relationship of convenience. He wants to be in the center of your life. He wants to be that person that you do everyday life with that you have conversation with all throughout the day, not just at bedtime or at mealtime, you know, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. That's not what Jesus wants. He wants more than that in your life. He wants to be in the center of your life. And He's asking you, He's asking me to invite Him in. And when we break free from this spiritual indifference through pursuing the things that matter to God, repenting of of the times that we don't do that and invite Jesus to be the center of our lives. When we do that, we break free from spiritual indifference and Jesus ignites or reignites this spiritual passion in us. Where we're more concerned with uh, with God's calling in our lives than we are with what people think about us. We live for what lasts. We don't live just for what won't last. We want to be bold in our faith. We want to be dependent on God all day, not just when we need Him, not just when we're in trouble. And we live differently. We want to live differently than the world around us. If Jesus was editing your life, what would He want to change? Is it possible that spiritual indifference is something that He would want to undo this this attitude of meh towards spiritual things? Would He want to undo that in your heart? Here's good news. Jesus absolutely can ignite or reignite spiritual passion in your heart. He, He says He's standing at the door. He's knocking. He wants to come in and do that for you. So open the door. Open the door. And let Jesus come in and undo that spiritual indifference in your heart. Let Him ignite that spiritual fire, that spiritual passion, so that you value the things that matter to God, the people that matter to God. I don't, this is me, I don't want to walk through life disgusting my Savior did too much for me to think that that's okay. And I have a a good feeling that most of you in the room would say the same thing that you said. You're right. He died for me. He, He went through torture so that I could be right with God, so that I could have eternal life, so that my life could be transformed. It's not okay that I walk through my life thinking that, you know, these spiritual matters are just kind of take it or leave it. And so here's my prayer for you, my prayer for my own heart, that we would be honest about that, that we would allow the Holy Spirit to point any areas of our heart, any areas of our life where there is even a little bit of spiritual indifference and let Him come in and undo it.